Don't call him daddy. That was the order given to Chinese state media in 2016. For years, Beijing created a cult of personality around Xi Jinping and promoted the nickname Xi Dada or Big Daddy. There were Big Daddy themed songs, cartoons, and videos like this one called Xi Dada Comes to Our Home. <laughs> The lyrics say, marry someone like Jidada, a man full of heroism with an unyielding spirit. So romantic. But why was Big Daddy banished from the media? Well, party officials were concerned Xi was starting to look like Mao, like a dictator. But now that fear is morphing into reality because last month Xi did away with term limits, allowing him to stay in power for life, just like Chairman Mao. Xi has consolidated power, he's jailed critics, kidnapped activists, censored the media and the internet, and he's flexing his muscle on the global stage too, using China's wealth to exert power in Africa, in Canada's energy sector, and of course, Korea. Xi treated North Korea's Kim Jong-un to a full state reception in Beijing last week, sending a clear message to President Trump, when it comes to peace in Korea, we got this. Xi's moves make him arguably the most powerful leader on earth. And if he succeeds at brokering a unified Korea, it might result in denuclearizing North Korea, but it could also threaten the U.S. military presence in South Korea, a vital strategic outpost for the West. A strategic win like that would cast him as the go-to leader for resolving global crises, not just Big Daddy in China, but around the world. Joining me from London is Chris Katerna. He is a Canadian consultant and author who specializes in Chinese politics. So, Chris, it was quite something, this visit of uh, Kim to Xi in Beijing. We saw these photos, and here's this guy, Kim, who's been sort of threatening to blow up the world, sitting and almost sort of subserviently mm. taking notes from, from Xi. Is this, like, how big a difference is this in the, balance, the world balance of power? Almost like we thought that Trump was a superpower. Is Xi now the, the world superpower? It's a great question. China wants to establish that it really is the guarantor of peace and security in East Asia, not the United States. And having Kim come to Beijing in this kind of subservient role only underscores the message that China wants to give uh, within the region and also sending a message to the White House that if you want to come here and do some grand summit business, fundamentally we're going to control the pictures, we're going to control the narrative and make it appear that whatever does come out of a meeting between Trump and Kim ultimately is derivative of the relationship between China and North Korea. So maybe it's good for China, maybe it's good for Korea, but I do wonder what impact Xi's growing power uh, will have on Canada. We've seen a lot of change over the decades. Pierre Trudeau reestablished diplomatic relations. Stephen Harper was, was criticized for sort of pushing a hard line on human rights at the expense perhaps of trade. We saw Justin Trudeau, the prime minister, head off to China in December. He was basically sent home empty-handed, we understand it's because the government, the Canadian government tried to raise issues of gender equality and labor issues, and it sounds like mm -hmm. Xi was just mm -hmm. having none of that. Like, how far can we push? We want the money, but can we, can we push on human rights still to get the trade that we want? Exporting values is a very tricky business, and, and my understanding of what happened with Trudeau's visit is that uh, the Chinese were willing to talk about free trade until we put sort of our, our, our uh, political and cultural agenda on the table, and then they decided, as you say, that, well, you know, uh, no, if, if the terms of the deal are we have to sort of subscribe to your worldview uh, in order to talk trade, uh, we're not going to do that. So does Canada have to compromise its values then to, to, to have trade with China? I think what has to happen going forward is, is not just Canada, but, uh, but the rest of the trading world with China has to have a, a kind of come to Jesus conversation with China that says, going forward, we're going to have to have a pathway to reciprocity so that by 2030, 2040, uh, whatever kind of foreign investment you want to be doing in our countries, we're going to have to be able to do in yours. And that includes cultural industries, that includes a lot of industries that right now are protected within China. President Xi, for a while, the people were encouraged to call him Big Daddy. Is, is, 
Is he becoming mm. the world's <laughs> big daddy? <laughs> the, the main thing to understand is that he is, uh, he is uh, a member of a political dynasty. Uh, he's basically a Kennedy, right? His father was a revolutionary hero who, who fought with Mao, who marched with Mao. Xi Jinping is the first leader who is of the generation of, of the children, the princelings, of the revolutionary heroes. His dad was a war hero, and that means that uh, he didn't just come to power. Uh, in China, where the party owns all the guns, uh, pulls all the strings of the state, he was born into power. Chris Katerna, thank you so much for all of your views on this. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much.